everyone. Um, so today we are going to talk about strategic design. We could have an entire course. We have entire degree programs on this topic. So this is going to be a very kind of surface look at what we do when we're thinking about um, design. But a lot of times I have to um, have conversations with people about what design is. Oftentimes when I start using this word design um, with my clients or with students, um, they have an idea of something in their heads uh, to define that word. And so before we get into it, I want to take you through a few images um, that help to sort of crystallize what design really is, especially how we're talking about it here today. I'll give you a minute to like look at these and you're going to notice a pattern across these images. So this is something that happens all over the world. And I wonder if you can start to see like what is happening here. See that campus shot, right? It's even something that's happened historically. Happens in the winter, very easy to see in the winter. It's even such a common phenomenon that in movies, animated movies like Monsters, Inc., right? We see animators building this into their storylines. Does anyone know what these are called? These are called desire paths. Desire paths show up when um, architects, designers of outdoor spaces create pathways and sort of imply to human beings like, hey, this is where you should go. Um, but what is hu a human being sort of natural inclination, right? To follow the path or to do something new, actually to become a designer, right? Because what's happening here is that people are saying like, no thanks, that path doesn't work for me, but a different path does, right? And over time, we can start to see, oh wait, Probably we should have put the path there, right? Probably that's where people really want to be going. And so this is an image that I have in my head an awful lot as I'm thinking about the entire design process, right? That we think we're going to create a path, but if we really watch, if we're really careful, if we really talk to people and spend time with them, we can probably find out what path they want us to be creating. And so with that in mind, I offer up this definition of design to you, that everyone designs who devises courses of action aimed at changing existing situations into preferred ones. Um, this comes from a book called The Sciences of the Artificial, written by Herbert Simon. Herbert Simon um, taught here on CMU's campus, um, Nobel Prize winner, very, very important um, person as they were thinking about this particular topic amongst many, many, many other topics. I think a political scientist actually by, um, by training. So when we think about, it's kind of showing up funny. Um, when we think about this idea of an existing situation and a preferred one, there's really two halves of this, right? The existing situation and the preferred one. When I think of this existing situation, I think of what is, right? What is currently present? What is there? And then when I look at the preferred alternative, I think about what could be, right? Those are really the two halves that we're balancing when we're talking about design. And there's a model that expresses this very nicely. So oftentimes when we see design, we see this double diamond or something that looks like spirals, um, but this, model is called the analysis synthesis bridge model um, and was created by uh, researchers Hugh Dubberly, Rick Robinson, Shelley Evanson here, um, and other people have kind of taken this model and built off of it. So another example of this is Joanne Mendel and Jan Yeager used a similar model to this in their um, knowledge visualization and design practice. 
um, exploring the power of knowledge visualization article, which was in uh, Parsons Journal for Information Mapping. It's a great article. I highly, highly recommend it. So the way that they are conceiving of the design process is really in these four quadrants. And so to orient us, we have the vertical axis, which runs from concrete, what is like real, we can see it, we can touch it, we can feel it, to what is abstract, right? They're kind of thoughts, ideas, models, expressions. And we have the horizontal axis, which, which runs from knowing to making, right? Thinking about stuff to making stuff, right? And so in that first bottom quadrant, this is really where design starts. We start at this place where we're very concrete and we're very much interested in knowing things. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to understand what is. And I spend a lot of time, uh, I uh, advise the capstone program over in the um, MHCI. And I spend a lot of time with the capstone teams at the beginning of their two semester capstone really pushing people to understand this concept. A lot of times we move past this really quickly, like, oh, I kind of know what's there. Think about those desire paths, right? Those planners, they kind of thought they knew what was, where the path should be, what was there, but they hadn't really taken that time to understand where people would want to walk, where people would naturally walk, right? And so this process of understanding what is is something that we really want to give weight to in our design process. And what this looks like in practice is that we're really asking questions like, is it this or is it that? And trying to understand the nuance between, I think it could be this, but it could also be this. Like, let's talk about it. Let's watch. Let's talk to more people. Let's really understand it. And once we feel like we really understand what is, we move up into a more abstract place where we start to take that what is apart. We're deconstructing it. We're saying, hey, if I made a picture of it, what would it look like, right? We're starting to build models. We're starting to build frameworks. We're starting to try to express what is in uh, terms and in pictures that we could sort of show to other people to help them understand it as well. What this deconstruction does is it starts to illuminate opportunities for us, right? When we make a picture of what is, whether that's a stakeholder map or a journey map, we start to be able to see like, wait, here are the breakpoints. Here are the challenges. Here are the things that we actually need to be designing for, solving for. And once we feel like we've really taken something apart and we have a really good picture of what it is, we can then move over to the other side of the diagram where we start to think about what could be, right? And this transition, this is called the analysis synthesis bridge model because this is sort of where we're bridging over from analysis into synthesis, from that sort of deconstruction of something, like this is what I think it really is, let's think about it, let's talk about it, into the space of synthesizing something, making something out of that, right? So in this quadrant, we're really exploring what could be. We're still in the abstract, but we're starting to make more things, right? That might look like, hmm, let's see, maybe I'm gonna make a little storyboard that sort of describes what I'm thinking about what could be. That might look like, maybe I can make like a really, really rough mock-up of this system, right? I'm just beginning this process. And finally, we land back in this fourth quadrant um, where we're really making what could be, right? This is where we're back to concrete. We're really putting sort of a stake in the ground, putting something out into the world saying like, this is our solution. Now that could be a really, really um, a high, high fidelity prototype. This doesn't necessarily mean it's our final product, but we're really saying this is how we're solving this problem, right? And then what happens is, we, oh, wait, let me talk about this. So this side of the map is our existing situation side, right? This is where we're really thinking about that first part of the design quote. And the second side of the map is where we're thinking about that preferred alternative, right? The second part of that design definition. And when we're in design, we use this phrase, how might we? 
you might, you probably hear people saying this, right? Like, how might we blah, 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 blah. Like always using this character. And there's a very specific reason that people who consider themselves UX people or designers or human-centered designers or, you know, whatever the, the, the term is of the day, there's a really specific reason we use this term, right? These words each have an individual meaning. How means we understand that this is a question, right? That there's not one specific way of doing things that we're really thinking about, like, what could it be, right? Might implies that maybe. It may be this. It may not be this. And we means we do it together, right? It's not how might I solve this problem. It's how might we. Because we know that when we have multidisciplinary teams, when we have lots of really interesting kind of different types of people at the table, that's when we're going to make the best solutions for people. And so I'm going to run through each of these quadrants, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about a few of the methods that you might see or that you might use in your process to make your way around that map. So in that very bottom quadrant, the understanding what is quadrant, there are, there's, there's many, many things that you could do in order to understand what is, but I offer up a couple of these to you. The first is observation, right? It seems really simple, but oftentimes we don't really spend time watching the people who we're designing for use the thing that we're trying to improve or be in the situation that we're trying to make something for. And it's really, really important for ourselves to spend time in that space, just trying to understand, like, how are people moving through this experience? What are people doing when they're using this thing? How, what are they talking about? What do their facial expressions look like? Who is with them? Who is influencing them when they're in that space? Just really like getting in there, right? And so in my practice, there are many times that I will like post up in a bank branch, right? And sit and just kind of watch how things are happening, right? Or go onto a factory floor and just kind of watch and try to observe what's going on, right? That's usually the very sort of start of my work. The next thing that you can do is immersion. The difference between immersion and observation are immersion, you're in it. Observation, you're kind of back, you're a fly on the wall. Immersion, you're actually doing the thing, right? So if you're trying to build a new system for opening a checking account, you open a checking account. You experience what that is to actually do the thing that you're trying to improve, right? We're actually immersed in that experience. And then as we're doing it, we're kind of holding two things in our minds at the same time. The first is, what is this like for me as a professional? Like, what am I seeing? What am I noticing? What's kind of broken here? But also how does it feel for me as a human? Right? How am I feeling? Like, how is this stressful? Is this fun? Was that person delightful that I talked to or kind of a jerk? Right? We're trying to sort of do both of those at the same time. The last one that I have here on my slide is called contextual inquiry. It's a bit of a blend of both of these plus some interviewing. Contextual inquiry is when we're immersing ourselves in the context of the situation, but we're really also talking to people who are um, a part of that environment, right? So you see there's a little picture, they're on a construction site. And you imagine that one of those two people is a, is a researcher, right? Is trying to better understand this experience. They're there, they have the hard hat on, they're probably making their way around the site throughout the day, but they've stopped to talk to this person to say like, hey, so I see you using this tool, right? Can you show me a little bit more of how you use that? oh, wow, I noticed that you wrapped a, a rag around the back of it. Why did you do that? How is that helping you, right? That you're really trying to understand more about how people are in this space. And we do these things in combinations and over and over again. And sometimes we do some observation and then we do a little bit of immersion and then we go back to observation and then we might do some interviewing, right? We're doing these things in combination until we get to a point where we think, I think we got it. I think we understand what is, right? We can sort of say it, we can describe it, 
we can describe it like really specifically to each other. And that's the point where we begin to deconstruct it. So it's so funny how these go <laughs> bumped. Um, where we begin to deconstruct what is. Um, and this is where we start to create those models, right? We feel like we can really say it to each other, but we don't really have a good way of conveying it to other people who aren't like a part of our immediate design team, right? And so it's really important for us to start doing things like creating stakeholder maps. Is this something people are, have familiarity with, stakeholder mapping? Some of us are nodding our heads, right? Building stakeholder maps, experience mapping and journey mapping and service design blueprints and all of this kind of mapping land that there's tons and tons and tons of examples of this that you can find online as well as lots and lots and lots of different um, books and tutorials that you can read up on if you're interested in this world of experience mapping, uh, journey mapping, et cetera. There's also affinity clustering and diagramming, right? This one kind of straddles the boundary between a few different things. It straddles the boundary between understanding what is. It can also be a diagram that we make to deconstruct what is. It can also be a diagram we make to begin to explore what could be, right? That one, that's a kind of a multi-purpose designer's tool. And that's what you see when you walk into maybe a project room and people have a bunch of post-it notes clustered together with big circles around them and arrows that say like, this is it, right? That's what an affinity cluster looks like. Now we're moving to the other side of the diagram where we're starting to explore what can be. We only do that after we have this really, really good sense of what is. What is the current state, right? Because without the understanding of that current state, we have no way of devising a preferred alternative because we just don't know what we're making an alternative to. But once we have that sense, we move to the other side of the, the quadrant. This is where we're exploring. We might start to do things like a creative matrix activity where we are um, brainstorming at the intersection of an idea, a statement starter, a question like how might we, or a specific kind of person, and an enabler. Enablers are things like social media or technology, right? We're coming up with ideas, lots and lots and lots of different ideas that fall at the intersection of a couple of different things. We might also make storyboards. Maybe we have a good sense of what we're trying to build or create, but we wanna sort of map out like, how is this really gonna unfold? And this is something that we borrow from animators and movie makers where we're kind of taking those key frames in the experience and making a little picture, right? A little sketch of what should happen there with a little bit of description about it. It's important in some ways that we are making those sketches because that language, that visual language that's happening in those sketches actually becomes something that two people can point at and talk about. We can't do that with verbal language in the same way, but I can come up here if this is something that one of my teammates made, I could say, hey, I see you've got this on a laptop. Are you really thinking it's only gonna work on a laptop? Is this not for mobile? I thought people were doing this thing at the bus stop, right? So we wouldn't be able to have that kind of conversation if I wasn't communicating visually. We might also do something like making a concept poster. When I do concept posters with my clients, I usually tell them we're making the first app for our product, right? It's a sketch that describes like, what is this thing? What's it gonna be? Who's it for, right? We think about the different criteria that we need to have um, in order to communicate about that. And we begin to brainstorm some of those, right? This is a concept poster that says like my flight. And then finally, we're making what could be. And this is when we're really starting to get into that concrete space. That might really look like very specific wireframes, not like just sort of sketchy, like maybe this is what it's gonna be, but really specific, like, no, here's, um, here's where people are gonna enter their name, right? Here's where people are gonna enter their address. This is how this experience is gonna unfold. It might also look like doing something like paper prototyping, where we're kind of building a prototype. And this one here, you can see these designers have even created like a little um, 
paper that fits over a screen so it can feel really, really real to the person using it, right? And you're actually asking people to like play with these little slips of paper and um, kind of use the product in the way it's intended to be used, but with paper. We also get into pilots and experiments and experience prototyping where we're really kind of putting that thing into the world and watching people use it and asking questions about how they use it. And when we do that, when we land down here where we're making what could be, now we've created a new what is, right? Now we've kind of created reality in a new way and we start again, right? Now, since we've put something out into the world, the what is has changed and it's time to keep going, right? So this isn't something that we just sort of do once and stop. As designers, we're sort of continuing to make these loops around and around. Sometimes it can look a little bit more like this too. Here to here to here to here to here, right? And back down, right? We're not always following this in a perfect kind of box motion. Okay, so before I get into, I wanna do a little activity with us, but before I get into that, I wanna open up the floor for any questions about that process, what people are doing when they're inside of that process, how to do it specifically for your projects. Go ahead. Yeah, so the quadrants, I'm wondering whether, is that <laughs> everybody, all of the ideas have to go to the very first level and jump to the work and then, yeah. Yeah, so like I said, you could maybe make some jumps around here, but it becomes really difficult to jump from like one to four right, like understanding what is to making what could be without really being able to take something apart. People kind of do that a lot. That's the one that you see often where people are like, yeah, I kind of get what's going on here. I'm gonna just create something and see what happens, put it out into the world and see if I can sort of affect change that way. Sometimes that works. If it's not working, it probably means there's a real need to really take that what is apart and like understand more of the nuances. It might be that that's not the exact right thing, right? Like those desire paths. It's not the exact right path. And so people are sort of expressing discomfort with it in a way that is sort of hard to capture. That's when you probably want to move up into the abstract. Um, can you add all of them as an example to possible of a time you walk through this process? On any project, mm -hmm. what that looks like. Yeah, sure. So several years ago, I worked on a project for a client where they said, hey, we really want to understand um, what happens during people's retirements. And we have this, I'm trying to be careful about how much I talk about, um, we have this very specific idea of what happens, right? They had this word that they were using, this very specific term that they were using that they felt was a really important part of people's journey into retirement, their financial journey into retirement. And so we said, okay, cool, great. We're gonna understand that very specific thing. And we went out and we started talking to the professionals that work in this space. We started talking to people that were going through retirement. And what we learned was that very specific thing was not a thing. No professional told us, oh, yeah, we do that. Yeah, that's a really important part of our process. Um, no retiring person said, oh, yeah, that's like super important to me. I really, yes, without that part of the process, this would be terrible. So we started to say like, gosh, what is it then? What does this process look like? And so our conversation shifted from trying to understand that thing. We sort of took a step back and said like, well, what is the process then? What is it like for people? And what you see a lot of times when you're talking about a process is this sort of like a box and an arrow and a box, right? And an arrow and a box, right? 
And so we started this deconstruction of what is. We sort of knew what these main tent holes of the tent poles of the experience were. But this particular model expressed in this way really didn't work. And we couldn't figure out why it wasn't working. We wanted to sort of be able to imply, well, you don't just go from here to here to here. Sometimes you go backwards, but sometimes you also get stuck in one of these spaces. How do we convey that? And this took a long time for us to spend saying like, but what is the shape of this thing? It's not this. We don't want these back and forth arrows. What could it be? And one of the people on our team had just come back from uh, Europe and he said, you know, um, what about a roundabout? Is it, a, is it are, these are these actually roundabouts, right? And so that became a really helpful visual metaphor for us to express this process where you didn't necessarily move through the process in a straight line every time, right? But like with a roundabout, I could get stuck here. I could stay in this part of the process for a long time and then I could move on, right? I could also get all the way out here and say, you know what? This isn't for me, I'm going backwards, right? Which you can do in a roundabout. And when we were able to conceive of the experience in this way, what that produced for us was this understanding that we needed to be designing for an experience that was not linear, was also not um, just back and forth, but also had this, someone might be stuck in this phase for a long time by choice or not by choice. And so we really needed to understand that. Then the types of things we were exploring were based on this model, right? So we were talking about things like, well, how do we create the ability for someone to move through if they want to move through? How do we help the professionals that are a part of this experience move someone through? How do we help the professionals that are a part of this experience know when someone needs to move backwards, right? Or needs to stay in one space, right? And so that became sort of the foundation of things. And then when we actually started making things, we had some very specific concepts that were particularly focused on those parts of the experience that we knew were challenges because we had created this model, right? But we would not have been able to do this if we didn't have that very deep understanding of the current state. If we would have just... <laughs> If we did, if we weren't able, if we just had taken what our client told us, like, hey, this is the way it is, and said, okay, great, we're gonna make some stuff for that. Because actually the project that they wanted us to do was, hey, fix this software tool that we built for this very specific situation. The software tool was not the issue and ultimately was not even a part of our, our recommendations. We actually said, you know, like, get out of the software business. There's other people doing this, right? So our recommendations were much more for this experience that we drew. No, that's kind of big, but- That was good. But you say it takes a lot of time. Did your clients pay you for that? Yeah, yeah. So we, I mean, we, we when we um, scope a project, we know that there's going to be time whoops, spent in each of these quadrants. And after a while, you start to know, like, I know about how much time I'm going to need here, here, and here, and here, and here, and here. I, it changes for how, it, it changes for how um, much you, how, what body of knowledge, like, already does exist for that particular topic and how much you have and how much time you've spent within that particular space. So... There's not really a good, like, four weeks here, four weeks here, four weeks here, four weeks here. Um, maybe, yeah. you know, a 12-week process or a 16-week process is probably a good place to start that you have, you know, three or four weeks in each quadrant. But you might have two weeks and then six weeks, right? 
So, right, or you might make something and then put it out into the world and understand it. Um, you might move through it really rapidly. You know, there are people who will do these very rapid cycles through this in a week, right? Some of the sprints kind of do this in one week. They have a day assigned to everything, right? So there's not a good, like, perfect way of doing it. I think the message is that we want to hit all four in our process. Other questions? Uh, I struggle sometimes to be subjective when I look at um, like understanding what's going on. And even in industries, I have no idea. Yeah. Like I make up stories in my mind and I say like, yeah, it's obviously this way. It's obviously mm -hmm. this way. So like what are tools or guidance on how to be totally subjective and bias towards a, a problem or, a, or understanding? Yeah. Bias is, is a really difficult one, right? Because again, our client was very, in this particular situation, our client had a lot of bias, right? They had a very specific belief about how this thing was going to go. When someone comes to me and said, like, I'm, I'm, I've begun to be more and more and more skeptical as time has gone on, right? Like I've learned like people don't always have this exactly right. Um, so when someone comes to you and says like, this is what it is, right? That's usually when I sort of turn on my like contrarian, like I'm gonna go out into the world and look for that thing, but also maybe look for not that situation to be occurring, right? I'm kind of doing both. Um, but I think it's really, really important to not allow yourself to fall in love with sort of any one theory, particularly when you're in that understanding what is. And almost to challenge yourself, like if you feel yourself starting to say, oh, I think this is what it is. I think this is what it is. Without doing that deconstruction or without really spending time thinking about the nuances to almost know that, that some of that bias is creeping in, right? If you jump to that too soon, you might be right. But you also might want to use that as a flag to say, am I just bringing some preconceived notions to the table? You get better at turning that off as you do this more and more. You get pretty good at like entering situations sort of as a blank slate, like knowing what your client has told you, knowing what secondary research you've done. And then putting that sort of in the background and stepping into a situation like, all right, show me what you got, right? I know this stuff, but I'm not bringing that to the table with me when I'm in observation mode or when I'm in interview mode. You can also make theories, right? We can go through this process and make a theory about something and then put that theory out into the world and understand if that theory is true. Right. And so sometimes you're doing sort of a quick loop of this process by saying, hey, is this it? Is this the, di the diagram? And then you're putting it in front of people and explaining it to them and talking about it in order to understand if this is the right thing to kind of characterize their experience. Right. This becomes the new what is. And so you're sort of testing, like, is this true? Is this accurate? And you'll see people like they'll tell you. Like, no, 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 it's not like that. I will say when we put this um, up in front of our client, a lot of times when you have sort of an insight like that, what it opened up for them was, yes, we have not been able to figure out how to draw this or create this, but yes, that's it, right? And you see that sort of relief of, yeah, that's been a thing for a long time. We were trying to do it like this. We were trying to do these backwards arrows and triangles and different circular models, but this is actually what it is, right? You see that relief kind of happen for people too. But it's a hard one, we're also human. And so by the way, two solutions might be appropriate for one problem, right? Your design team could come up with a really good idea. Another design team could come up with a really good idea and maybe both solve the problem right, in a, in a useful way. So it's not necessarily about there is only one right answer either. Um, I just wanted to ask, 
when you, I know over time as you practice this, you get a better sense of the gut feel. Yeah. But I guess for us as, you know, younger entrepreneurs, yeah. figuring these out now, when do you know when to move from like one to two? And yeah. You start to look for, um, you, you might do something that looks like a blend of one and two where you're kind of going back and forth. Right. Yeah. Right. So where you're maybe you're going out into the field and you're having a conversation with people and you're coming back and you're saying, like, I think this is it. I think it's these squares and these boxes. Yeah. Right. And then you um, come back from maybe another interview or another conversation or another observation and you say, no, it's really not this. This is really not it. Right. And you're kind of doing that back and forth until you feel like you have something that really does express what it is. Like there's no more sort of dissension yeah. among the team, right? That we're not talking anymore about like, is it this word or that word? Is it, um, is it trust that we're trying to create or loyalty, right? Is it about trust or loyalty? And you're kind of going back and forth between these two words. And you get to a place where you say, no, it's really loyalty, but it's this kind of loyalty. And it's this very specific metaphor we're using around loyalty. And we all kind of agree that it's that. And when you have that sort of sense amongst yourselves, like this, I think this really is the right way to characterize this thing. And you have a picture that you feel like is the right sort of accurate drawing of it or articulation of it, then it's probably time to start moving to the other side. Because when you have this picture, what you're able to say is, oh, you know what, here's an issue. What if we, how might we create something that solves this problem, right? Oh, here's an issue. How might we create something that solves this problem? Oh my goodness, this whole thing is a big issue. How might we tackle this whole big problem, right? And so that's why it's important to have that visual expression of it so you can actually literally see where the breakpoints are. But there isn't really a right answer. Again, it's sort of an it depends too. There's probably times when we just move on because we have to. The constraints of the project are such that like, you know, we don't need to have the exact right metaphor, but we've got to keep moving. And so sometimes we do that too. Other questions? I saw another hand. Yes. Um, I was like a big fan with like over the summer when I went in for like the chip was like I would go in and like look at a design and like not be able to ask questions about like is this something that's like an industry standard, like everyone should know it kind of thing, or is this like is this something new that like needs to be like a very high thinking? So how can you like is there like a, like instead of just like, oh, like spend time looking at the product for a couple months and kind of understand it. Yeah. Is there a way to like distinguish things like that? That makes sense. Is the, yeah, is the question like, how do I know if this is just the, the way that this industry does this thing or if this is like a very unique and special yeah. interpretation of that? Like, 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 like a chair. It's like, is there a reason why it has four legs? It's like, I feel like at this point of like chair innovation, yeah. it's like, that's just the standard now. Sure. But it's like, how do you know what's the standard versus what's like, oh, it's a three-legged chair, that's innovation. Yeah, that's a really good question, right? I think if I were in an internship role and someone was saying to me like, hey, Megan, Here's the design we have for this product. I, and I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, well, this seems pretty standard, pretty basic, like, but maybe this is just how the industry does this thing. I might try to get time with one of the people that is literally making that product to say, like, talk me through this. And I wouldn't be afraid of saying like, oh, I see that you've made it in this way. I see that you've created this chair here with four legs. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Is that just like how we make chairs or is there a really specific reason that this chair has to have four legs? Has anyone ever made it with three legs? Would that be weird if we made it with three legs? Like why four, right? I'm in my role, 
I have the freedom to ask those kinds of questions, but I would also say you should have the freedom to ask those questions too, right? You caveat them by saying, this might seem like a silly question, but do we have to do it this way? You know, is this a design standard that we have here at our company or did our client say we had to do it this way, right? Who says? And then sometimes the answer is gonna be like, eh, you know what, good question, I don't know, we just picked green. We just thought green was a good color for that thing. And sometimes there's gonna be a really, really, really specific reason why. Like asking being curious about this thing. Being curious. Like my um, friends and family, like anywhere I go, I'm like asking people questions, right? I'm in line at the airport and I'm like, oh, what's that thing? How does it work? Why did you do it that way? What's this? How's like, you know? and so you get to a place where you are really like interested in how everything around you is unfolding. And I think it's okay to um, express that curiosity. I would be pumped if someone on my team was like really interested and excited and curious about the stuff we were building. So I wouldn't be afraid to do that. Other questions? What are we on time? 50. Anyone online? Other questions here in the room? Okay, great. So let's um let's do a very quick uh stakeholder map. Okay, well, I'm gonna walk you through the steps of this. Um, we're probably not gonna get through everything today, but we're gonna walk through the process and then I invite you to kind of take this back to your project teams and, and try this. Yeah, so we're gonna hand out some post it notes and paper. Put a stack at the end of each row, just kind of pass that down. One each. Oh, take as many as you want, a couple pieces. You might mess up. In practice, you might decide to do this on a whiteboard, something like that. The markers, thank you very much. Fun to write with sharpies, they're nice and bold. You can see them. Sometimes people write on books that notes with little like, ballpoint pens, and I'm like, I can't see it from the top. All right, the first thing we're gonna do, I, I think that most of you are at a place with your projects where you have a sort of a sense of what problem area you're going to be inside of, or maybe a potential area. So when I say area, I might mean public school systems or Retirement, right? The space of retirement or food service or grocery stores, right? You kind of have a ecosystem that you know you're going to be working inside of or you kind of want to be working inside of. You can pick either one of those. Does that ring true for us? Do we have sort of a sense of what those places are? Kind of. It's okay if it's not like perfect. No, we're not collecting these. All right. So stakeholder mapping, as I mentioned, falls up here, right? So we're kind of jumping ahead to this, making a model of what is, but here's how we do it. The first thing we're gonna do, you can either use your post-it note or a piece of paper. You're gonna make a list of all the relevant people, right? Who exists in that space? So when I was thinking about retirement, I would have listed out the person retiring, their spouse, their financial advisor, their HR person, their, um, their kids, right? Their neighbors, right? Their nieces and nephews. Yeah, you can use either the paper or the post-it notes. There's no right way to do it. You're just making a list of all the people that exist in that ecosystem that you're designing for, right? And we're not gonna be able to do an exhaustive list today, but in practice, you should do an exhaustive list, right? It should be, yes, that's a good question. It should not be the HR department, not the 
kind of group of people, but the type of person, the role, right? So HR leader, right? HR admin, right? So like, for example, um, like, I'm like, trying to build an app that like, I want like, CMU to take on like, a good Yep. So would like CMU Central, would that be a role? That's us, it's like, we want them to want to adapt. Who at CMU? I don't know, I've just heard the term about like CMU Central, like the group that like took on Snellick as a like full time. So hint for you. If you don't know the exact type of person, it's time to go back down to the quadrant one and really understand what is, right? Like who's all in this space? But I think for you, like whatever CMU Central is, there's probably like a decision maker, right? Inside of CMU Central. There's probably a bunch of CMU Central like workers that don't have decision making power, but they do have the ability, they are the ones using the stuff using the tool all the time, right? There's the people who the tool will affect, right? Which is probably either students, staff, faculty, right? So you wanna put those people on your list. You're also talking about users? You can talk about users, but you also wanna talk about all the people that exist in that world, right? So for us, this project we were designing for professionals that are working in the retirement space, right? So we weren't actually, the, our user was not the retiring person, our user were the professionals, but it's important for us to put the retiring person, their kids, their spouse, the, um, the people who they're gonna pass their wealth along to, if they're not their kids or their spouse, right? It was important for us to list all of those people out because they live in that ecosystem. Let me make a, a team or a an organizational transformation. Isn't that include a lot of people? Yeah. If they're starting one team, but requires alignment on a broader level. Yeah. So if I were designing for, like, if I were creating a product that was going to affect the HR department inside of a large organization. I want to understand not only like who's in the HR department that's specifically going to be using it, but where those tentacles go out into the organization and who's going to be touched by the fact that the HR department now has this new thing, right? So like, oh, well, if they now have a new tool for tracking your continuing education in HR, who does that affect? oh, well, that affects the people who are getting the continuing education, right? And it affects the people who are not getting continuing education, right? Because now there's a way of tracking that. So it's like, who are you designing for? But then also, who are all the people that are impacted by the fact that those designs exist? So the next thing I'm gonna invite you to do is begin to build some clusters of people, right? So you can cluster these people in a lot of different ways. You could literally cluster them by department, right? Like you could say, okay, well, this is the HR group. This is the finance group. This is the marketing group, right? You could do it that way. You could also do it by like concern. Right. Well, these are the people who need blah, blah, blah. These are the people who need this thing. These are the people who need this thing. Right. You can, your different problems will kind of ask you to cluster people in different ways. You could be really literal or you could be kind of metaphorical with that. So, since we're running on limited time, maybe find like two clusters among your group that you can kind of look at. 
And here's what I would do as I'm making my cluster. I would like literally draw, you know, the international kind of easy way to draw a person. Right, it's just a little circle. Oops, this marker doesn't work. Just a little circle with a little kind of shoulders underneath. You could literally draw and write like, you know, H R manager, right? H admin. Okay, so here on my little stakeholder map that I'm building, I've created a few clusters. Um, this is probably a lot larger of a lab, but I have my HR department here and my HR department has a specific need, right? So I can use a little speech bubble to express this priority, right? Or I can just write it here, but the HR department needs a way, a good way to track people's CEUs. I've also created a bubble, which is the CEU earners at our company. And those are the attorneys and the paralegals. And these people really want the HR department to have an accurate tracking of their CEUs because that's how they get paid. We have other people that work here, though, that don't earn CEUs. And they really need HR to be as efficient as possible because they need them for other stuff. Right, so we want to be aware of those people too as we're designing this. It's not just CEUs that is their entire function. So the last thing that we'll do then is that we'll begin to draw arrows and other shapes to show how these groups are related to one another. Right, so we might say this person sends certificate, sends a paper to HR department after training, right? And then we might say updates employee file with cert. Right. So we start to say, like, how do these groups interact with each other today? 
not how do we wish they interacted with each other, how are they currently interacting with one another? This all seems very simple, um, but I'll tell you a story about a recent workshop I did with a group who was adamant that they knew their stakeholders, absolutely adamant. So we said, okay, well, let's do a stakeholder mapping exercise. I think it would be good for us to have a really clear sense of who's, who's out there. And when we got into it, outside of their immediate group, they really could not identify the people inside of the rest of this very, very large and complex organization that they worked with for and um, who they were beholden to, who their real clients were in the organization. They couldn't identify their titles. They couldn't identify, they couldn't make these clusters. They really did not know, right? And you find this a lot, that you think you have a sense of the landscape, but when you really try to start making this picture of how everything is related, you can't do it. And so if I actually didn't know this question, well, I know that those CEU certificates get from the person who took the course to the HR department somehow. I just don't know how that happens. I have a couple choices, right? I can ask someone. I can go into the space and observe to see how that's happening today, right? I could do a combination of both. Right? I could talk to this team and talk to this team and see what, they, do they say the same thing? Do they both think this thing happens the same way? Right, But in those places where I can't draw the arrows or where I can't identify what this group's real goal is, those are the places where I probably need to go back to what is, right? Because I don't have a good sense of that yet to answer that question from before. If I can't make this map, there might be something that I still need to understand further. All right. So this is kind of what we're driving towards, right? This comes to us from the Luma Institute who um, creates a lot of these wonderful um, methods, has a great site, uh, Luma Workplace, which I would highly recommend that you all check out lots. L-U-M-A, Luma. Yep, Luma Workplace. Um, some of you may know Adam Polisic. This is a project that I helped him with. He was really the, the mastermind of this, um, where he created a bunch of these Miro templates um, for all of these different design thinking HCD methods. Um, if you wanna do them virtually with your teams, um, you'll see some familiar faces in the training videos for these. And that's it. Uh, you can connect with me on LinkedIn if you want. There's the QR code to the strategic design kit. Um, and that's me. I'll hang around for a couple more minutes if anyone has any questions. Um, I think we're at time. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.